Good morning. I'm Dr. Austin, and I will be talking to us on organic chemistry. That's our topic for today. What is organic chemistry? Organic chemistry is said to be the study of carbon and its compounds. Of course, not all compounds of carbon, but the majority, the vast majority of them. Now, a modern periodic table, a complete one, has 118 elements. These 118 elements uh, begin with hydrogen and end with um, organesson, that's element 118. Now, of these 118 elements, one is studied in this aspect of chemistry, organic chemistry, while the other 117 are studied in another aspect of chemistry called inorganic chemistry. Now, a question you may want to ask is, why would we give one aspect to one element and then the other aspect to 117 elements? The answer is simple. It is because the um, compounds formed by this element alone would outnumber the compounds formed by all of the other elements put together. So in that case, this compound deserves full attention, like we are going to give it now. Now, carbon is element number six in our periodic table, and that means its electronic configuration can be written as 1s2, 2s2, 2b2. But I tell you, it may also be written as 1s2, 2s1, 2p3. Should you come across this two, don't panic, just know that this is for carbon in the ground state, while that is for carbon in the excited state. So depending on the state of the carbon atom, its electronic configuration could vary. Now having said that, these organic compounds we are talking about, why are there so many? What makes carbon able to form so many compounds? Well, the first reason I'm going to give you is what I call reactivity. Reactivity of carbon. Carbon is very reactive. Carbon combines with different elements, oxygen, sulfur, hydrogen, the halogens, all of them, metal, phosphorus, you understand? So as it combines with these different elements, it forms different compounds. Remember, when elements come together, we get compounds. So as carbon continues to combine with different elements, it keeps giving us different compounds. So that's one of the reasons. And as it combines with these elements, it does so in a very versatile manner. And that is because it has this second property, tetravalency, tetra four. Now, this refers to the fact that one carbon atom can bond to four other atoms at the same time, like this. This is carbon. So it means up there you could have H, 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 four hydrogen atoms. Some other cases would come with H, 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 Cl, H, 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 Br, H, H, Cl, Cl, just like that. So you can take four atoms at a time and that increases the probability of it forming new compounds. And then the third one is the fact that carbon undergoes or exhibits what we refer to as catenation. What is catenation? The ability of an element to form long chains of itself. Now, when it comes to catenation, carbon is the gold standard. It is the gold standard. It is the typical example of elements that are able to form long chains of themselves. So that you could see an organic compound having several carbon atoms in the long chain. And of course, with every carbon atom that is added, the number of possible compounds that can be formed will increase many fold. So these are basic reasons we have many organic compounds. Now that we've seen that the organic compounds are so many, possibly in their millions, the question is, how do we study these millions of organic compounds? Well, uh, nature has made it easy for us in the sense that these organic compounds, even though there are so many, are not unique in themselves. I mean, if we have one million organic compounds, for example, they do not have one million different identities. Many of them show similarity in properties. Just like the humans we have in Nigeria, they do not all stand individually. You could have 10 people from one household. Yes, we refer to them as members of a family. Similarly, organic compounds exist in families. 
and we call their families homologous series. So what is a homologous series? There's a standard definition for the term. We say a homologous series is a family of organic compounds showing similarities in properties. So a family of organic compounds showing similarities in properties will be referred to as a homologous series. Now there are different homologous series, I mean different families now of organic compounds that we have in this aspect of chemistry. So we'll mention them. However, these homologous series, assuming we visit one of them, what would we find? What trend do we find within any homologous series we visit? I'll list the characteristics of a homologous series and comment on them briefly. Number one here is general formula. Number two is functional group. And number three is method of preparation. Now, general formula. What do we refer to as the general formula of a homologous series? That's like the surname of a family. Remember, if you have a family, let's say, headed by Mr. Frank, you call the family the Franks. All right? So similarly, we say that the general formula of a homologous series is like everybody's formula like a surname being everybody's name in a family. Now, the different homologous series we have and the general formulas will be listed soon. But for now, let's just mention this family. We call them the alkanes. Alkanes are also called paraffins. <clears throat> now, the paraffins or alkanes, let's list the first three members. We have them as methane, ethane, and propane. These are the first three alkanes. Now, they conform to one formula, which is the formula of all alkanes that exist, and that formula is Cn H2n plus 2. So from this formula, you can get their individual formulas. Now, I just talked about individual formulas. That is like in a family, talking about individual names, your first names. So within one family, you could have Mary, James, Frank, James, John, James. So James becomes the surname, the family name, while these are individual names. So in like manner, this is like the family formula, the general formula, and the individual formulas are things like CH4, C2H6, C3H8. So these individual formulas they have, we refer to them as molecular formulas. So members of the homologous series have their own individual formulas called molecular formulas, but everybody's formula is the general formula. Now the functional group. What does functional group mean? Um, if you were to watch an international conference on TV, where you have an American, let's say the president of America, the president of um, uh, Scotland, the president of several other countries, you know, you have all of them coming together. By the time this person sits, by their dress modes or dress codes, you may be able to tell where the different persons come from. For example, if you see a man dressed in a Nigerian native attire, agbada and cap and all that, you can easily tell this is a Nigerian. So the way that dressing can help you identify the person. Functional goods help us to identify organic compounds. And to a large extent, they also determine how those compounds will behave. So the behavior of an organic compound is in its functional group. If two organic compounds were here, one of them does a particular thing and the other is unable to do it, it will simply be because of the difference in their functional groups. So functional groups are for identification and they also account for the characteristics of organic compounds. Now preparation. However you prepare the first member of a homologous series is roughly the same way you prepare the second or the third. So they usually have general methods of preparation that works for everyone. Now beyond that, there's this fourth one that is very interesting. We say successive members 
differ by a methylene group. Now that group CH2 is called methylene. Now when we say successive members differ by methylene group, the point is as you go from methane to ethane to propane and so on, successive members now, you discover that the formula keeps changing by CH2, more like CH2, CH2 being added. So the addition of such CH2 to the formulas makes the um, members become their next members. I mean, for example, if you have CH4, which is methane, by the time you add CH2 to its formula, what you'd be getting is the formula of the next member. So if you have the fifth member of the homologous series, just add CH2 if you want the sixth member. Then there's the last one here that we must explain in some detail. It says, as the number of carbon atoms increases, so as we go from two carbons to three to four to five and so on, the boiling points, melting points, and densities all increase, while the um, volatility and the solubility in water decrease as the number of carbon atoms increases. Now for that to go down well with us, I'm going to um, write three compounds here. Okay, we already had them here. So CH4, C2H6, C3H8. If you look at the number of carbon atoms, what do you find? One, two, three. So when the number of carbon atoms is one, okay, see, as it increases, so going from here to there, what happens? Boiling points will increase. So of these three, who will have the highest boiling point? Yes, that one. Highest melting point, that one. Highest density, that one. Highest volatility, this one. Highest solubility in water, this one. So as the number of carbon atoms increases, boiling points, melting points, density all increase, whereas the other two decrease. So that is what the last statement means. Now, having seen the characteristics of a homologous series, the next video will show us how to classify organic compounds.